Am I on? Great. Awesome. How you doing, church? Good? Man, worship was full. Hey, what's up, Caitlin? Good to see you guys. Hey, I just want to take a moment uh, and recognize some people that are in the room because I feel like they're just the most important people in the world to me. So my family is actually here uh, in church with me today. My, bro- my father, uh, Brian, my brother, Rush, my niece, Addison, Jim, and my mother. I love you guys. I'm so glad you're here. Um, Addison, I have a mission for you. I need you to wake Rush up when he falls asleep, okay? So if he falls asleep, just give him a little elbow, all right? Deal? All right. I love you. Hey, so we've been talking about being on mission and how that's supposed to work out in our purpose in life. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 14 through 16. So if you have a Bible on you, go ahead and open that up. We're going to be right there in the scripture. If you do not have a Bible, we're going to have one right behind me for your viewing pleasure. And if you could, could you stand to your feet? We're going to get ready to read God's word together. And right before I read this, I want to give you a little bit of context. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is motivated because he sees a crowd around his disciples. So he goes to a mountainside and he sits down. And his disciples are listening to Jesus, and he opens his mouth, and he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who are meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. And he goes through the Beatitudes. And and this is what uh, we would call one of the most famous sermons that Jesus will ever preach. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And so Jesus is basically describing the culture of the kingdom. Everyone say kingdom. kingdom. Everyone say culture. And Jesus is exemplifying this is what the people of God are like when they are a part of a culture that we would call the kingdom. And after he explains in the Beatitudes who is blessed, he then looks to his disciples and he says this, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all that is in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give, your glo- give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, help. Amen. Hey, turn to somebody and say, God's got you. You can take a seat. Hey, John, can you throw me that water? Mouth's a little dry. Amen. God provides through John Lash. A couple weeks ago, I was at the Sawgrass Mall. We've been doing this thing called the Evangelism Institution, and I've been taking people around, and if you've gone, you, you thought it was pretty cool. We talked about it. We uh, were sharing our faith with people, just anybody that we could talk to, anybody that was open enough to have a conversation. And I met a girl named Kaylee. Uh, she's 20 years old, and we talked for about a half hour, and she was very open to the idea of following Jesus. Uh, She had a few uh, arguments about why she wouldn't follow, but by the end of our conversation, something happened, you know, like a a flip switched, and and she said, you know, I honestly don't really know because I've never really tried it, so maybe maybe I could just trust Jesus and and just follow him. And so right then and there, a girl I met for 30 minutes gave her life to Jesus on the spot. I prayed with her. She repented, and she turned from sin, and Following up with our conversation, I said, man, I'm so so happy you did that. That's so cool. And I could see it on her face. She was relieved. She was like, yeah, I kind of feel great. And I invited her to church. I said, come out to church with me. We were literally right down the street uh, at at Western High School. You'd love to come. I'm guaranteeing you, you'd have a great time. And at one point, she was happy. But then when I invited her to church, she just kind of looks at me and she just goes, no, I I can't do that. I said, well, why can't you do that? She says, to be honest with you, I've just, I've encountered way too many hypocritical Christians. And I was like, wait, wait, wait a second. Hypocrisy is not a Christian thing. That's a human thing. She was like, no, no, no. Like, I've met so many two-faced people. They, they said they were going to do something, and they didn't. Like, like they, they just acted a certain way from the opposite of the way they were preaching. And, and to be honest with you, I just don't want to be around people like that. And as we've been talking about this, this idea of being on mission, we've, we've discovered that the world is dark. I think it's obvious. We live in a dark world. There's evil in and around the world You know, I I turn on the news and I see that poverty rates are climbing and that terrorism is happening on the daily and there's children who are being sex trafficked. It's awful. But honestly, I feel like the real tragedy in our world is not that, you know, we just live in a dark world. I think it's apparent and we've always kind of known that. But the real tragedy is that the light of Jesus Christ has been given to us as Christians and we continue to light or put our light under a basket. And I want to talk with Christians for just a second, people of faith that are in here who are part of our faith family. Can we just be honest? We're fickle. 
We say one thing and we do another. We lie. We cheat. We gossip. We're judgmental. And sometimes we're just downright weird. I'm serious. We're just weird people. It's tragic. And, and to be honest with you, I, I realize that Kaylee probably didn't want to come to church because the reality is she, she gets a picture of the American church that looks nothing like Jesus. It breaks my heart because she's so open to being around the person of Jesus, but nowhere around his people. And I feel like I'm supposed to call us today to stop putting our light under a basket and to let our light shine, to let our light shine. And, you know, our world is longing for this light, church. Our world is longing for the light of Jesus. They so badly need it. And, and it's so funny because universally, even people who aren't Christian will look at things like kindness and generosity and, and, and just things that are selfless and go, man, that is awesome. Man, philanthropy is huge just because people are like, you know what? I'm not going to think about myself. I'm going to look to other people. And, and you don't have to be religious in order to believe that this is a good thing. And I remember watching this video, and I was like, man, this is an example. Like, this, this video exemplifies just what one little light can look like in a culture. So check this out. I want you to watch this video. 14-year-old Keontae is full of life and laughter, <laughs> largely because of his parents. If someone said I'll offer you money for your parents, I'd say heck no. You, they're worth more than what you've got. In 2007, when Keontae was just eight years old, Gloria Campos featured him as a Wednesday's child who had already learned the golden rule. Treat people the way you want to be treated. After a failed adoption and disappointment, Gloria did another report on Keontae two years later in hopes the second time would be the charm. I have been different homes, and the adoption ha didn't go very well. Carol and Scott Cook saw Keontae's video and knew right away he was their son. He just kind of spoke to us through the video. It just seemed like he was talking to us. I'd like to say thank you for putting him on a second time because not only did you bring us the child that God wanted us to have and we wouldn't have seen him otherwise, um, but you've also helped touch millions through him being able to talk about his story. Two years ago, Keontae spoke before Congress describing his four years in foster care where he felt he was over-medicated with mind-altering drugs. What did that medication do to you? Uh, well, when I first arrived at my parents' house, my mom said that she'd woke it up and went in my room and found me walking in circles. Now a healthy young man completely off medication, Keontae is a runner, avid hiker, and a great dancer. He knows this all might not have been possible without Gloria's persistence in finding him a home. I want to say to her that I think, uh, thank you so much because um, you've made my life worthwhile and that uh, you've helped me become the person I am right now and I probably would have been worse off had you not helped me out. He's definitely our, our son, our child, and we love him very much. It is so good to see Keontae. We were just sitting there at Keontae. Oh, he was the karate boy. And so smart, John. And it broke my heart when that first adoption did not go through for him. I'll bet, because he seemed like quite a young man. Oh, very smart, and obviously he's with the right family. He at is last. with the right family. In at fact, last. he's with the right family. Oh, my God! Yes. I can't believe it's you. Thanks so much. Thank you for this big surprise. I'm so happy that you're happy. Am, you are, right? Yeah, I'm happy. You love your family. Yeah. Thank you for coming. No problem. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Proud of you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, see? that's quite a surprise. Man. I watched that video a couple of times. I'm just like, okay, all right. <laughs> Why do we love this stuff? Why do we look at this stuff and we're like, hey, you don't have to be Christian. You can just look at it and go, man, that's beautiful. I think it's because, because we're made in the image of God. We're made in the image of God, and this is stuff that we're supposed to do. We're, we're supposed to experience this stuff. We're supposed to see this stuff in our world, but... But what I thought about when I saw this video is like, man, this woman, this anchor woman who probably has so many other things she could be doing is putting Keontae on for a second time. You know, the first time it didn't work out and she takes a second step to go and do something. And I was like, man, you know, she probably knew that she couldn't fix the foster care system at large, but she could help Keontae. 
And I feel like sometimes people don't want to do anything because they can't do everything, right? Do you ever get that feeling like, oh, well, I mean, I'm not going to fix the whole problem, so I might as well not even take a right foot forward and try to do something. It's interesting to me, man. A little bit of light makes a really big difference in a really dark world. And as I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about what Jesus says as he shows up on the scene to his disciples in John chapter 8, verse 12. He says, I'm the light of the world. If anybody's going to follow me, they're no longer going to walk in darkness, but they're going to have the light of life. Let me make a few distinctions about what Jesus is saying, because I think when people hear that, they're like, well, Jesus is saying he's a good person, like he's coming as a light. Jesus is not a light. He is the light, right? And in him, there is only light. Outside of him, there is only darkness, you know, I kind of feel like Corey Castle, this kid that I was uh, doing seventh grade algebra with, was in my classroom as I was reading this scripture, because I realized every time I took the test and I got a 60 or 70, I was leaning over to my buddy. I was like, what'd you get? He's like, yeah, I got a 60. I'm like, okay, great. What'd you get? He's like, I got a 70. I'm like, great, great. The curve is coming. And then I look at Corey and he's just like, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I'm like, Corey, what'd you get? He's like, I got 103. Come on, Corey. Come on, Corey. Why did you get 103, Corey? Why did you have to go do it? Why couldn't you just get like a 90? Why couldn't you just get like a 95? Something to give me a little bit of help. And when I read this, I think about Jesus kind of breaking the curve for all of humanity, right? Like, like some of us are better than others, right? Some of us are drowning 50 yards from shore, and some of us are drowning 400 yards from shore. And I think the people swimming at 50 yards from shore are like, oh my gosh, I can't believe how far behind they are, right? And the realization is both of you are drowning, okay? And Christianity is this. Both of you need a lifeguard. I don't care how good you are. And Jesus comes on the scene to say, look, I'm the light of the world. All of you are in darkness, and it's offensive. But what's crazy is when Jesus gets to the mountainside, and he sits down with his disciples, and he starts to speak about the Beatitudes, and then he says in Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. I'm kind of thinking to myself, like, wait a second. What are you talking about? Jesus like, I'm the light of the world. Like, I get that you're the light of the world, but, like, I'm the light of the world. Like, I kind of feel like Jesus is the uh, captain of the kickball team, and he's like, yeah, I want you on my team. And I'm, like, the unathletic kid, you know? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm looking behind me. I'm like, John Lash has got great calves. He could totally, he could totally play this game much better than me, you know? And Amen. thank you, John. I appreciate that. Sometimes I just don't feel worthy of the calling. And sometimes, honestly, I just hide my light under a basket because I'm like, I just don't really believe that the light that Jesus says that I am in the world is the same light that he was in the world. Yeah. And it's crazy, man. It just, it shocks me that, that Jesus has given us this light and, and, uh, and he's kind of relaying this message like, look, everything that I was and more, you're going to become. And as I was reading the scripture, I, I was looking up in the Greek, I kind of nerded out and I was like, all right, well, what is, what is light? What is Jesus saying when he says light? And when I was thinking about it, I was thinking about kind of the lights that we would even see in this auditorium. Like you can see there's a, there's a density to the lights, right? We can kind of make it brighter or more dim. And what Jesus was saying is he was actually saying the Greek word phaos. Everyone say phaos. And phaos actually translates into the word fire. So back then they didn't have electricity, right? So when Jesus is saying light, I think we might get it complicated that, that light is just this thing that can be controlled, but but when Jesus says, you are the light of the world, he's actually saying, you are a fire. And a fire is not easily controlled. I mean, my brother is a firefighter. He has dedicated his entire life to fighting fires. Rush, how hot can fire get? Pretty hot. Pretty hot. Spoken like a true firefighter. I mean, fire is hot, and it's not easily controlled. And it only takes a small spark to get near something flammable, and a forest fire can happen. And I was thinking about it. I was in the Bahamas a couple years ago, and I remember just drinking some tea, and I was sitting next to these big bohemian men, and I kind of look over, and I realize everybody is drinking tea. And I'm like, why do you guys drink tea? And they're like, well, we were settled by the British, so it's just kind of a thing. Like, we drink tea. I was like, oh, I just never would have known that unless I knew that you were settled by the British. And I went to, uh, went to Haiti, and I saw that people were speaking a dialect of French, which is Creole. And I was like, why does it sound so much like French? They're like, well, we were settled by the French when they first got here. And I was like, man, that's, that's so crazy. So you're telling me a people that were here hundreds of years ago did something, and then there was a remnant of the things that they did? And they were like, yeah, I was thinking about it. I was like, man, the kingdom of God, if we are a fire that God has put on the inside of us as a culture, when we go places, 
man, we're supposed to set things ablaze. Like, we're supposed to be places like Broward County, and then 100 years from now, there's supposed to be a remnant of the fire that was in us, in our culture. And then my hope today is that when I speak about the light, you don't think it's this small little thing that we can control. No, it is a fire that is flammable. And I'm telling you, if you were to just take the basket off of the light, you would see that the light is so much more powerful than you would ever have imagined. Because a little bit of light makes a really big difference in a really dark world. Hmm. Man, that's good. I'm just like, I'm feeling that right now. I kind of want to keep preaching on that. So I, I'm speaking very charismatically right now. You know, I'm like, come on, let's be the fire, right? I'm like, come on, we're, we're the light. And I, I know that we've heard this as Christians, that we are the light of the world. But I think practically when it boils down to like what we do to become the light that Jesus has called us to be, um, I think it's important to walk away with something. So the first thing I thought about was, I mean, the experience I've had in this community, I moved down here a year ago, and being around all of the people of God that I've been exposed to and seeing the encouragement that has come from that community. I mean, I think about guys like Manny, who's probably not even in the room because he's out with our kids, but I mean, the guy just loves kids. He's passionate and he's zealous and, and he's, he's just all for Jesus and all for other people. And I know when I get around him, I just get super encouraged. Uh, when I think about the Chaco family, Chacos, are you in here? No. Oh, well, Crystal is. I mean, you can tell your dad. I mean, you guys are so generous. I mean, every time I get around you guys, there's always just some kind of provision that you're meeting for somebody. Uh, when I think about Jerry, one of my roommates. Jerry, you in here? Jerry, man, this guy keeps me from having shallow conversations. You know, he just goes super deep when he's talking about God. I'm like, all right, well, I'm not going to be able to have a shallow conversation right now, so I guess I'm going to have to go deep. And it's like, I think about Carlos and Luz, Urrutia. You know, these two have been married for, did you just celebrate your 34th year of your marriage? That's amazing. Man, you guys, you know, getting to be around you guys has exposed me to this idea of what long devotion in the same direction looks like. And it was, it's just been so encouraging. And, and John, yeah, you actually don't really do anything for me. <laughs> But you guys get what I'm saying, right? Like, when you're exposed to the right people, the right community ends up fueling the right mission, right? And, and I just want to encourage you, man, if you haven't yet gotten into community and you've been here for a little while, we've got these microchurch, like, brochures. I'm not on there, so I don't want you to look at it just yet. Uh, no, just kidding. We've got microchurch leaders in here that love Jesus, ready to meet with you, ready to go deep with you and explore faith and basically push you to be the light that Jesus called you to be. So... After service, if you want to go outside and jump into a, a microchurch, please, like, feel free to do that, and I guarantee you'll get more than what you bargained for. You know, I think the, the scripture that I'm thinking about when I think about um, community is, uh, is Hebrews 10.24. It says, uh, do not neglect to meet, which is the habit of some, but all the more as the days are encouraging each other all the more as you see the day drawing near. I feel like that's what community does. You know, community it encourages me to continue to remember, I'm, I'm only here for a little bit of time. Jesus is in heaven, and he is coming back, and he's going he's gonna to show up in all his glory, and, and I need to be ready. And the community does that for me. The second thing uh, would be to identify your basket. Everyone say, what is your basket? What is your basket? So I got a little light here, and it's shining. And uh, I was thinking about how Jesus gives every Christian the light, right? It's on the inside of us. And then in Matthew 5, verse 15, Jesus says, don't hide your light under a basket, but put it on a stand so that it gives light to everything in the house. And I was thinking about this. I was like, man, basket's like a really tangible thing. Like, basket could be something like a circumstance, right? And I was thinking about the scripture Hebrews 12, verse 2, where Jesus talks about how we need to lay aside every weight and sin that so eagerly clings, toward, clings to us, that causes us to not run the race with endurance. And what I thought about, it, I was like, well, clearly like a bucket to the light would be something like sin. But what I was thinking about in this verse is that you don't necessarily need to be morally sinful in order to not be running the race or shining your light. Sometimes you could just have on weights. Right? And so the weight that I was thinking about was the circumstances that I deal with, you know, on a weekly basis, you know, and for some people it might be finances, for some people it might be uh, a relationship that's just broken in the family, uh, for some of you it might be your health, 
Um, for some of you, it could just be the fact that you're in church and you don't really feel like you're experiencing God. You feel like you've just been waiting on God. And, and it's, it's crazy, you know, I feel like with the circumstances that you deal with that, are strugg- that you're struggling in, they shatter your expectation for what your life should look like. Yeah. And I want to say this to you today. I really want you to hear me. Listen, God might not live up to your expectations, but I promise you, he always lives up to his word. He always lives up to his word, and his word says this, rejoice. Rejoice in times of various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith will produce steadfastness, steadfastness that will cause you to be lacking in nothing. You'll be perfect and complete. So when when you're going through a circumstance, when you're going through, think about it right now, like what you're going through, because it's easy. I mean, you know, it's the dark cloud in your life. It's the basket covering your light. When you choose to magnify the Lord and put him in his rightful place, everything on earth gets put in its rightful place and the basket comes off. Take the weights off. Magnify the Lord. Give him glory and I guarantee you the light is gonna start shining. The second thing I would talk about is what everybody knows is is sin. And I say this word and if you're not from a Christian background, you're kind of like, well, what is sin? Sin is anything that offends God, anything that distance you from God. And so when I'm talking about sin, I'm talking about things like pride or, or greed or lust or, um, I, I don't know, I've got a bunch written down here, but I don't feel like I need to go over all of them. Sin is sin, and we know what it is, and we know it convicts us when we do it. And there's a simple scripture in James 5.16. It says that when you are uh, with brothers and sisters and you confess your sin, right, there's healing in that. And in just a moment, we're going to take some time where you're going to get to come up here and you're going to get to take the basket off. You're going, to get the, you're going to get the light out, and you're going to let the basket come off, and you're going to confess sin, and it's going to be awesome. And, and you know, I feel like I could have all these, like, um, illustrative stories that could entice you and lure you, but as I was preparing this message, I was like, man, I could, I could tell more stories. I could say things that are a little more cool. But I was thinking about it. I was like, Lord, what is really going to serve you? And I realized it is his word. It is a word that is going to do any, any type of work in your life. And, and God's word says this, that if anybody confesses sin, if anybody confesses and repents and turns from sin, the light that was being shut out by the basket is going to get removed. It's going to come off, and you're going to start experiencing what you were made for. You're going to start living on mission, and people are going to start looking at you, that you're going through your circumstances, but you're still able to praise God and be like, man, what is the reason for the hope that is within you? And here's what I want to say. I want to say this. This all depends on whether or not you really get the gospel. For Christians, some of us are 20 20 years old in our faith. We don't even know how to articulate the gospel. We don't even know what it really is. And for those of us who have not understood or ever heard the gospel, I'm going to explain it in just a moment. Christians, the gospel, people who are here from a different faith, the gospel is this. The light of humanity is off. It's not on. And God, out of his benevolence and his goodness, as the light of the world, comes into the world, and he lives as the light, and he helps us understand, and he exposes the darkness that's within our hearts, and he exposes all the darkness that's on earth. But instead of judging us for the fact that we're in darkness and just going, well, he's never going to get it. Does it remind you of some judgmental Christians? He's never going to get it. Let's just forget about him. Jesus prays and he sweats blood, and he, and, he, and he weeps over what he's seeing. And instead of judging us, he gets close. He comes into close proximity with humanity. And instead of telling people that were sinful, hey, like, you don't deserve any type of relationship with me, he says, hey, let's go get some food. Hey, Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house today. And he has community with people who are not found. And he knows he's the light. And he knows if he can be around them, just like that fire that gets close to something flammable, they're going to catch flame and they're going to be changed. And so the light of the world comes in to a dark place where the light is off and he says, I'm going to let my light get extinguished in order for you to receive it. And my hope today is that you'd realize the gospel, that you don't deserve anything that God gives to you. You don't deserve to walk in light. You deserve to walk in darkness and to be punished for that darkness because your sin has separated you from a holy God. 
But what's so good about the, the purpose and the, the mission that Jesus had while he was on earth is he didn't come down to point out the fact that we were just sinful. The law already did that. He came to fulfill the law and say, no longer do you have to follow a bunch of rules and make this about religion, but this can be something that you pursue instead of not do. And you can follow me. And when you follow me, just know that the light is going to start coming out of you. So if any of you here that are Christian feel like you have a basket covering your light, man, I just want to tell you, rejoice. Rejoice in the circumstance that you're facing. If you're in sin, repent and turn. And if you haven't accepted Jesus yet, man, I encourage you, receive the light today. There is nothing like it. I have never known anything like Jesus. John, would you like to come up? And I hope you could take it from here and call us to the altar and if we could have Jamie come up, I'd love for you to play some music. We're going to get ready to transition to a time of worship. And I'd love for any of you that feel motivated or encouraged to come up and pray to get prayer. Thanks, John. That's good. We can give it up. <laughs> stuff. Why don't you guys stand to your feet?